I'm sitting here with the Mats Rosander, which is uh, kind of the, the pioneer and legend of the Swedish fire service and the development done in, in fire behavior and fire suppression. Uh, so Mats, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are and you know, your history in, in firefighting in Sweden? Well, the history starts a long time ago. I uh, started 1972 in the fire department of Malmö as a fire engineer uh, trainee, meaning I had to work as a fireman, but for less pay. And, and to be clarify, a fire engineer in Sweden would be the equivalent of fire protection engineer in the United States. Yeah, or uh, with American terms, uh, battalion chief. Uh, because on that level, you had to have some academic uh, studies to come in as a battalion chief. So through the ranks, you could go to chief. And, uh, battalion chief, you needed uh, a little more academic studies also. And then uh, what happened? What was your first impression of when we talk about the fire aspect of the job? We got extrication and all the other stuff, but if we talk about the fire aspect, what was your first initial impression about the, the firefighting done at Malmö Fire Service? Well, at that time it was um, the tactics uh, were very limited. Um, in a way, uh, we relied very much on smoke diving. And when I started in uh, 72, we had the best breathing apparatus in the world, I think. Um, it had overpressure in the mask. It had uh, 300 bars bottle pressure. And we had those double bottles. Um, so um, they come... Uh, the center of gravity came very close to your body because you were actually crawling a very, uh, very much and you were climbing ladders quite a lot and uh, center of gravity was important then. And also uh, we had a lot of air supply uh, with us. And um, uh, to, to understand the... Um, uh, regular working situation when you had a fire in an apartment. It's so that in Sweden we had a very cold climate and build, uh, buildings are very much um, uh, built to the climate. We had three glass windows since many years back. Uh, reinforced concrete buildings, well insulated for for the climate, and uh, we also had IKEA, which is a world today a worldwide uh, furniture company, but um, they supplied a lot of the furniture going into the Swedish homes, and uh, at that time it was a whole lot of polyurethane, foam rubber, plastic, covered with uh, a fabric that uh, was also combustible, synthetic. So um, the situation was actually that you had a lot of very combustible and heat releasing materials in an apartment which also functioned as a, as a bunker, as it was reinforced concrete, well insulated, and the glass, all those three glass panes, they didn't break, so maybe the first glass broke, or, and maybe even the second cracked a bit, but then the third was intact, so all the heat and all the smoke was actually contained in the apartment. So the regular situation was, uh, hell of a lot of smoke, very hot, and um, perhaps some victims inside that you had to rescue and get out. Anyway, you had to put the fire out because um, uh, we built uh, a lot of apartment buildings with many apartments in every staircase, so you cannot let us that thing burn, you had to go and do something about it. 
What was yeah. the so that was the what was what was training you got before? You know, what kind of training did you have before you <clears throat> did your first interior attack? Uh, we had a uh, local fireman school there, uh, introducing us to all the methods and uh, tactics and techniques and how to do things, hands on. Uh, and uh, what we actually did was that we used a one and a half inch hose for the smoke divers and then a nozzle that could be a solid beam or a, a little spray, maybe 20 degrees. You could open it up to a 20 degrees and spray water a little bit. Very much depending on the uh, German standard. We were very German in, inflated at the time. And uh, we used very low volumes of water. We used 75 liters per minute. That's a seven millimeter hole in the nozzle that we could use for spraying or solid beam. Or you would say smooth bore, maybe. And um, if you wanted to use more water, you always had to ask uh, the um, uh, fire captain there, can I uh, screw one nozzle off and use a little bit more water? And often he would say no, because he, to his judgment you should be able to do it with uh, 75 liters per minute. Uh, so we had a very, uh, a very uh, um, elastic hose, only one and a half inch, but we didn't really need any more because we were using 75 liters per minute. And um, we used actually the layman's method uh, all the time. That was the ideal, if you could go in there was so much smoke you couldn't really see where the initial fire was, but you didn't care too much about that as long as you could find a hot surface and use layman's method and transform those 75 liters per minute to, to water steam and let it turbulent out in the smoke and inert the smoke. And um, then you could start ventilate that smoke and then maybe you could see the initial fire and then you could attack the initial fire directly by using the solid beam on the initial fire. So that was the basic tactic all the time. What, what was the general impression of firefighters? You know, did they like this method or did they question it or? Uh, <clears throat> no, no, they liked this method and um, uh, it was, everybody was uh, convinced this was a very effective method uh, because everyone knows that one liter of water could transform into, into uh, uh, 1,700 liters of steam and so actually you didn't um, uh, all you had to do was to transform a couple of liters of water into steam and then you would have an inert atmosphere that you could ventilate out. And still there would be no water damage, uh, the floor would be still dry. Important to us because we were never fighting fires standing up, we were crawling on the floor. And it was imperial that the floor was dry, so you didn't get wet and get burned when you, when you were crawling over the floor. And everybody was convinced that uh, this is the way to do it. This is um, effective and this is good. And it is, uh, the secondary damages were very low. What You talk about inerting the smoke, and what was the explanation for how steam acted inside the smoke layer. What was the explanation for that back in the day when oh, you started? It was obvious for everybody that you cannot burn water steam. So if you can uh, 
uh, have some water steam in the smoke, it would get less combustible. And a lot of water steam in the smoke would, of course, inert the smoke gases totally. Um, so it, it was a very uh, relevant from the knowledge that you had about water steam and you know, the knowledge you had about smoke, that this would work out perfectly. So was, was it, a, in terms of, of preventing uh, potentially dangerous environments like being inside a flashover, or backdrafts or smoke ignitions, did the method work of preventing those events for firefighters? There were actually uh, two big, um, uh, two big disadvantages of this method. Uh, the one was that once you transform the water to water steam, you will get the water steam on yourself, and it means that you were going to burn your fine, your ears primarily, and your neck and throat. Uh, so you really have to keep your uh, fireman's outfit very tight, you know. And that was often a problem, you know, tightening up the things while you were firefighting to uh, prevent the steam from coming in and sculling your skin, you know. Uh, that was one disadvantage. The other disadvantage was that you were you were not proactive. You were always responding to, if there was a flashover, you started to work to lower the flashover, but you were always second, you know. The flashover was first, and you were always second. And uh, if you didn't make it, you will not only get sculled, you will also get burned. You know? So uh, uh, the fire always had an uh, advantage upon you. But otherwise it was a very uh, a good working method, especially if you could stay outside of the apartment and uh, find the hot surfaces to uh, transform water to steam just inside of the door or something. Well, then it was really perfect, you know. But, uh, Life is not always perfect. You, uh, a lot of times you had to go inside, deep inside the apartment to find the hot surfaces and transform this water into steam. Uh, so the, the initial, the crew required for interior firefighting in Sweden is two firefighters inside, one at the door or outside and one pump operator and one officer. Mm. On the outside, yep. there's, a, there's a difference also between the United States and Sweden. The officers never go inside uh, in Sweden, or rarely go inside, I would say. Uh, what would be uh, the, back in the day, in, talking uh, when you started, what would be the role of the, the third guy there who's on the outside, the, the smoke diving leader? What would be his responsibilities and what would mm -hmm. he do practically when the firefighters entered? Well, um, basically he was there in case of something that happened to the pair of smoke divers that were inside. He could go in and help and drag the other guy out, or both if, if it's necessary. But uh, later on, he also had the job of uh, keeping a good lookout at the smoke gases. Are they prone to ignite or uh, uh, have you really inerted them with uh, water steam? Uh, how is everything going? You know, he could actually follow if the smoke diver pair was successful in their attempts to uh, inert the atmosphere and, and uh, extinguish the fire. Uh, and he could also warn and say, hey, 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 it's getting hot, hot out here. I'm having a fire here where the smoke gases faces the open air. And how are you inside? Huh? And um, so 
to make it uh, short, he, he was not only there for the safety of the pair that was inside, he was also there to read the fire gases to try to predict if it was going to get dangerous inside there. Was the concept of door control used there in the sense of, of closing the door against the hose line to, to limit air supply to the fire? Was that, was Def that? Definitely, yes. You cannot just swing the door open and let all that air in while you're smoke diving inside because you know you're letting oxygen in and something can happen. Um, so uh, the more smoke and the hotter smoke, uh, keep the door as closed as possible. Just let the uh, hose slip in and uh, as minimum, uh, as little as possible smoke slip out. So you contain this over carbureted atmosphere inside of the apartment where you're working. Uh, if it is a ventilated, controlled fire, it's imperial to keep it ventilate controlled. So, so uh, the concept of door control was established when you entered the fire service? Definitely. 1972 we knew exactly that uh, uh, keep the door as closed as possible. Uh, maybe we didn't understand all the mechanism behind it, but uh, we knew from experience Keep it closed. So, uh, was it ever discussed that if you close the door, you would lower the neutral zone, uh, potentially bringing poisonous gases down to potential victims, uh, with the upside of if you close the door, you would limit oxygen to the fire and the fire becomes smaller. Was that any, anything that was discussed in the fire service back in, in the 70s? It was discussed, but uh, going in means that those guys who are going in are supposed to be as safe as possible. If you have a victim inside or two victims inside or three victims inside, it doesn't mean we have to add another two victims from the fire department. So we were doing what we think was the safest for the fire group going in. And if you're safe for the fire group, you're let, letting them fight the fire and bring the fire down, you would do a more rapid rescue all thing. Yes, also, yes, that's all correct. It's uh, supporting, uh, it's not supporting visibility, or, <laughs> but uh, that's the downside. But on the other hand, if it ignites, if the smoke ignites, you will have a temperature rise there inside that might kill everybody. So uh, keep the door as close as possible. So uh, was there any, you talked about the layman method of, and creating steam. Um, the first question is, was that in consideration, would, 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 um, would that be discussed that if, if you, create so much steam inside an environment, inside a house, for instance, or an apartment, that the steam would hurt or kill the, the occupants trapped inside. Was that a consideration that was done? No, the steam will scull the outer skin of us all. But uh, that's not the thing that is killing us. Killing, um, the smoke kills, but that is from breathing in poisonous substances. It's not from getting sculled from, from um, um, uh, the steam created. Everybody that has a sauna bath knows about this. Uh, we are a lot of Swedes that have sauna baths. Uh, so, and the other question was that if, if, if this was the method that was used, the layman method used to find hot surfaces and create steam. Yeah. And if steam is that effective in suppressing f 
fire gases and making them incombustible, inerting them. How come we still had hostile fire events for firefighters where, where you had flashovers and, 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 and these type of events that, that injured and potentially killed firefighters? Oh, that is a, a lot of reasons. Um, one reason could be that the fire gases are uh, really combustible. So as soon as you open the door or just a, a few minutes after you open the door, you have created by the air inlet, you have created a very combustible mixture uh, inside or near the exit way and it ignites and maybe it ignites behind you because you're already way in. Um, that's one possibility. The other possibility, which is not very uncommon actually, is that you have a fire in one apartment and then you have smoke leaking out to the next apartment. Um, and uh, uh, when it's over carbureted in the initial apartment, you have a perfect carburation in the adjacent apartment. And then you have a source of ignition that could be uh, candlelight or uh, whatever uh, that's in there. And uh, then you have a smoke gas explosion because it's so correctly carbureted and it's not ignited at the lower explosion level. It's ignited at ideal. Uh, there, are, uh, there are so many possibilities actually with, with smoke gases. Um, uh, and uh, some of them are a little bit hard to predict, you know, especially those with the smoke in the, uh, in the adjacent uh, apartment. It's hard to predict to see exactly what's happening there and suddenly you were overwhelmed with, with uh, burning smoke gases or even exploding smoke gases. Was it a problem in finding hot uh, hot enough surfaces to actually vaporize water, to actually create that much steam that was needed. Was that a problem? Um, yes, it was a problem because if we're talking about zero visibility, you had to guess a little bit and uh, sometimes you guess wrong. Huh? And uh, if you're a little bit uh, nervous, maybe you uh, overestimate the heat that you feel and you think that, oh, okay, I found a hot place here. And when you open the nozzle, everything rains down and you get a wet floor and then you have to proceed and this was not the hot place. And, um, and a big apartment with many rooms, you really don't know which room has the hot surfaces, so you, maybe you have to do a bit of searching before you're sure. Huh? So you didn't do, if you didn't have a hot surface, you didn't, back in the 70s, you didn't spray water on smoke? Because it, uh, with those nozzles, uh, it was no use, it didn't do any good, it only created a wet floor for you to crawl over and and continue searching for the hot surfaces. So you knew, did the, did the idea of gas cooling, even though you, you hadn't gotten to the technique and the nozzle to do it, was the idea of gas cooling something that people talked about? You know, was that a, a thing that you talked about that we, if we had a different nozzle, could we cool the smoke inside the hallway going to the fire room? No. The general idea at that time was that don't ever spray in gases or flames because the water will just pass through it and it will do you no good and it will only wet the floor. Uh, it, will, uh, it will not help you uh, and it will not fight the fire in any way. The water will just pass through. That was the general idea. So you got to find a hot surface to be able to transform water into water steam. So 
Don't ever try to spray on flames or through flames or through smoke. So the, the, you had either the direct attack, which is attacking the actual seat of the fire. Yep. And it was finding hot surfaces and fighting the fire with steam. That was the two ways of, 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 of affecting the fire. Yeah, back definitely. In the 70s. Yeah, definitely. Yes, it was like that. Um, yeah. Did you have did you have other means of fighting fire besides water based? No, we had a lot of methods to support um, our fire interior firefighting, um, like for instance ventilation. Um, if you could ventilate on top of a, a contained space, we would always try to do that to release, to let out the heat and to let out the smoke and to, to do it more comfortable for the smoke divers. Um, but really no other uh, extinguishing method it was either direct, like a sprinkler works, meaning getting water on the initial fire, or uh, layman's method, transforming water to inert the atmosphere in the room. Yeah, basically it was those two methods. We talk about ventilation then. Um, so if you could, would that be an objective that was high priority to, to, ventilate the to ventilate the fire and get a hole above the fire? Was that a high priority mm. thing back in the 70s? Mm. Uh, it was um, uh, a method that you had to do uh, a bit carefully. Because um, uh, just like keeping the door shut to not let air in, you could not just crash the windows and let the heat out that way because it means that the smoke gases would perhaps ignite. It was on more attics and uh, those kinds of fire where you could have a hole on top of the uh, fire and just let the smoke out the way you let the smoke out of a fireplace where you have a chimney. Uh, then you could ventilate out the smoke layer and raise the neutral plane a bit. But we did, uh, there, it was absolutely forbidden to smash windows and things like that, except from orders from the captain. Is there a difference between horizontal ventilation and vertical ventilation? Definitely, yes. Uh, in, by my definition, Vertical ventilation is that you are raising the neutral plane. You are bringing in air in, uh, under the neutral plane and then it doesn't matter because there is no combustible gases there. And then you are ventilating out the combustible gases, but you are not mixing it. Mixing it happens if you smash a window or open a door into an apartment that is smoke filled with combustible gases. That idea back in the 70s that, uh, um, that you would, that it would be a difference between horizontal and vertical ventilation with the vertical lifting the neutral zone and not creating as much mixing, would that be, uh, do you think that would be achievable method um, for all fires in, in, in residential areas and everything to, to get that, that good effect of ventilation where the neutral zone lifts and heat goes out and the smoke goes out? Well, no, definitely not, because if you are uh, in a residential house and you have this um, uh, apartment fire on the fourth floor in an eight-story building, uh, how do you make that hole in the right place? Uh, it's uh, applicable in some cases only and only when you can assure yourself that you are going to open a chimney that lets out the combustible gases without mixing them with the incoming air. So what would happen if you create an outlet like that but it's not big enough and the fire is 
uh, for some reason more turbulent or and so so you get that mixing what would the outcome be if you do that vertical ventilation in that case of course if it's a, um, an over carbureted mixture of uh, uh, of smoke gases which is often the case and you mix it uh, with turbulent air uh, you will have a mixture that is combustible and you can have a smoke gas explosion or a flashover or whatever depending on when it ignites. If you look back to those terms like uh, flyshover and backdraft, was the, those terms used back in the 70s? Was that common knowledge between of firefighters? Yes, it was knowledge. Uh, everybody knew it could happen. And um, uh, we also had some terminology, flashover was uh, with some pressure and uh, flame pressed out through a door opening or a window opening, uh, like that. And we also knew that it could be a smoke gas explosion, with some more pressure coming, cracking windows or breaking doors, uh, like that. Uh, but the thing was that we all considered this a phenomenon and uh, uh, we often ask our superiors, well, well about this phenomenon, you know, what, what is uh, creating this phenomenon and what makes this phenomenon uh, making it explode sometimes, but not always, but sometimes it's, it's very soft, you know. And, and uh, the answer was always, but it's a phenomenon. And uh, today I interpret this uh, as, uh, you know it could happen, but you don't know why. You don't know the mechanism behind it. And if you don't know the mechanism behind it, you can't predict it, right? You can't predict it, you can't prevent it. Uh, so if it's a phenomenon, it's shit happens. So uh, then in the 70s, you start up, you start up working for Malmö Fire Department, did interior tax, and then you were sent to fire school, right? Yes, I um, went to the National Swedish Fire Academy uh, in, in Stockholm and um, uh, started to study there. Um, I had done some more time in Malmö Fire Department before that and uh, also um, did a short uh, uh, trip to United States for six months. Uh, so I also worked a little bit in uh, Los Angeles County and in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I know they also knew this problem, but it was a phenomenon. They had no real explanation, so I, I searched for the explanation, but I never got it. So tell me, uh, that's interesting, so tell me about the timing. How did, how, why did you, and how did you end up in L.A. County uh, from the, to, to start with? It was the um, fire chief of Malmö. He was very uh, uh, extrovert and uh, trying to bring in um, new impulses from the world around us. Uh, among other things, he, uh, he adopted the snorkel system that I had in uh, Chicago, especially in Chicago. So he bought snorkels to uh, Malmö. What was the snorkel? Um, it was a device that works um, about the same way as a turntable ladder, but uh, it has this basket and, and the two arms that is going up, up like this and then you can turn it and a bit more stable than the turntable ladder. And the articulated hot, the articulated lift, you mean? Okay, yes, that's what you call it. Yeah, Snorkel is, uh, uh, name, is the name of the company that uh, manufactured them, but it, it became, in Sweden, it became a technical term. If you... You either had uh, a turntable ladder or you had a snorkel. Malmö, we had snorkels. 
Yes, I think I, uh, I think it's it's an aerial aerial platform is also the aerial term. platform is the, yes, uh, is the correct word. word yeah. yes. Probably yeah. the most common vehicle in Sweden right now. Okay. I think the turntable is as as that's because oh well, different different topic yeah. different going there. Uh, so anyway, so L, so you end up in uh, due to the, your fire chiefs, uh, you end up in LA County. Yep. Tell me about your experience with uh, arriving in LA County. Tell me about the differences and the similarities you saw. Both in culture, but but primarily into the fire ground operations. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, LA County was uh, very well equipped and uh, very modern, except for breathing apparatus. They had no overpressure in their masks, um, so they were not really safe for smoke diving. Uh, maybe because of just that fact, they didn't do smoke diving the way we did it. They didn't like to go far inside buildings to find the initial fire. They were more prone to standing outside uh, of the building and fighting the fire. Um, massive resources, helicopter attack and everything, they, they had it all. Um, Fire trucks were very ancient, actually. They were, uh, uh, you know, uh, your bucket seats and standing behind of the car and, uh, and climbing to the car while it's what's driving 30 miles an hour and uh, things like that. But, um, the turnout gear was. Um, uh, very ma much uh, based on um, being waterproof at the time, uh, uh, meaning liquid coming from the outside on you uh, was uh, prevented and protected, but when you're getting sweat and you wanted liquid to go from your body and out, uh, that didn't work so well. So, a little bit different, yeah. But then. Uh, Jack yeah, what's the difference between Jacksonville? Yes, it was. It was actually, uh, I would say, some decades between them because Jacksonville, Florida was very traditional with American La France vehicles. Um, uh, guys were uh, responding to alarms uh, in their short sleeved shirts and uh, when they arrived they put on their rubber turnout gears and uh, breathing uh, apparatus equipment uh, even worse you know and hoses uh, very heavy with one male and one female coupling and uh, um, yeah, um, a lot of cultural differences uh, as well um, what did the Ameri what, what what was the positive things you saw in LA County? You know, things you said this this, uh, this is the things I'm gonna embrace and take back home. Mm, yeah, those guys they really had guts. You know, they um, uh, they were not uh, backing off any fire. They really had guts, even if they had, um, in my point of view, a bit poor equipment. And they really had problems in Jacksonville because I was in a knife and gun area and um, not only fires to fight but also a population that was not always friendly to them, a bit hostile sometimes, um, which was uh, very, very uh, awkward to me. At that time, the fire department uh, was only there to help and everybody uh, share them, you know. And, and, uh, but in some areas in Jacksonville, you know, you were not even welcome, even if there was a fire going on. Did you have any experience when you, was, when you were in America with, with big box firefighting, you know, bigger, bigger you know, warehouses, uh, stores? Was there any <laughs> difference between Sweden and America how to handle larger uh, volumes of fire? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I was there actually to study brush fires. That's why I was in Los Angeles County. But um, uh, 
in Sweden it's so that we are basing our tactics on that we are one plus four. A fire captain, uh, four men. We have the smoke diver team, we have the pump engineer, and we, ha we have the officer. And of course this is very, very limi limiting to the tactical options of how to fight fires. We are limited, we were at that time and we are today limited to strike by a smoke divers team with a high firefighting value. If you don't succeed, the next thought is always to put in two smoke divers teams and see if you can overwhelm the fire that way. Maybe next option is to put in three smoke diving teams together and see if you can overwhelm the fire that way. If you cannot, it is the LSB method, which means let the shit burn. Uh, because we have no tactical options. In the United States where you have, uh, you have your, your uh, ladder companies, you have your engine companies, and you have your special task forces and everything, you have uh, maybe ten more tactical options than we have in Sweden. So, um, Swedish firefighting puts more strain on the smoke divers teams than it does in the and so we have to relay very much more on those smoke diving teams that you have to do like in for instance the United States or Germany or England you know. maybe we could go back to the United States uh, later on but go back to um, your trip to the fire the National Fire School in Sweden so uh, again only talking about the fire part of, of the school not talking about the other parts um, uh, what was your first uh, impression uh, of the fire, National Fire School and, and, uh, and who was Christo Gieseson and, and what was your experience in, in meeting him? Well, Christo Gieseson was um, uh, a teacher at the fire school. Uh, he um, was a very special person in, in many ways. He didn't have uh, very much more experience in firefighting than I had, but um, he had a more scientific way of um, explaining things and thinking about things. And um, uh, when I was uh, presenting this problem, the phenomenon of flashover, uh, or smoke gas explosion. He said, well, that's pretty easy. It's just like this and that. And uh, I hardly could believe him in, in the beginning, but uh, I, th I knew he was somewhere. He was right, you know. He, and then he could present more and more proof by uh, uh, physical and chemical data um, that uh, um, really explained what happened and it was uh, solid science behind it, uh, but n not presented in, in a hard way. It, it was pres presented in an easy, understandable way. Um, by that I mean uh, that every profession has uh, a way to present um, um, uh, regular basic science, like, I mean, a, a pilot, he's got to know a little bit about aerodynamics, but he doesn't know really very much. He knows only what he needs to know to fly the airplane. And he can be very good at that part of aerodynamics. And uh, a fireman, he should uh, be very good at some physics, or thermodynamics that um, explains how fires do when they burn. So he can predict and prevent problems uh, during uh, uh, his firefighting works. 
So um, he presented that in a very um, easy way, you know. And the other way he was very special is that I'm sure he had some some of those letter combinations, uh, MTBE or whatever you call them, because he could read the list of a new class coming, 30 names here, and when he had read that one, he remembered all the names and he could say which one was which of them. You know. And um, he had a girlfriend uh, studying biologics in, in um, the university and she had a problem, you know, to cope with the studies. But so he read the whole course and uh, so he knew it by heart and better than anybody so he could help her and to uh, make and, and write the thesis and uh, get good marks on that course. And of course I didn't believe him at that time but Later on, he presented proofs that he really knew all the Latin words of, of uh, all the herbs and things there that we could find around when we were walking around with his dogs, you know, in a field. He could just pick a flower and says, this is the Latin name for that and that, and the reason it has this name is so and so. And, uh, so he had uh, a photographic memory and uh, uh, he remembered uh, absolutely everything. So uh, even, say for instance, the formulas for magnetism. Uh, I read that also in college, but uh, of course, once you have done the test, you forget it. But not with him. Once he had read it, he remembered it forever and could use it, you know, and uh, could say, oh, okay, um, well, if if you increase that, that will fall lower, and yeah, he was that type of person. You know. It's uh, a very special mind, yes. So, <coughs> when uh, so Christer was high, he was hired at the fire school just before you, right? Uh, yeah, 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 he was two years. Uh, he, he studied two years before me in the, in the fire engineering, and then he stayed at the school for uh, as a teacher for a while, yes. So how is, uh, when Christer started explaining scientifically these phenomena like mm. flashovers, mm. how is that received by by the authority at the school, at the national level, and how, how is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, received by the firefighters that he trained? Yeah, uh, you have a very specific line here because as he was a teacher and he could explain things, the firemen in his classes were, of course, uh, delighted, you know, because uh, they could relate to this from their job. And they could say, yes, he's right, and they could b believe in him. You know. They knew so much uh, from their job and their reality that they could say, yes, this guy is reliable, you know, he, he knows what he's talking about. And um, he could catch their attention, you know, and get them to realize things. Um, and again, he was not using uh, difficult words or, you know, trying to flash with some uh, Latin uh, terminology or whatever, you know. He, no, he was, he skipped that shit. He said, well, come on, it's like this, guys. Uh, uh, uh. And uh, he was reliable, you know, the way So he was he kind of an academic with a, with a you know, a, a, a craftsman approach to, to uh, yeah. science. Yeah, he based uh, everything on uh, on uh, academic knowledge, but he could forward it in common language. Was there, if we're strictly talking the academic side, the scientific community, which is fairly, you know, in many cases, you know, a separate field <coughs> compared to the craft machine, was there? scientific or academic 
knowledge of, of these phenomena before this in Sweden, but the connection to the craftsmanship was missing, or was it that that Christer started also developing the academic theories that and and also the connection to the craftsmanship? Yeah, at that time the academic world. Um, when it comes to fire science, they were, you know, researching on uh, how much heat can you get out of a wood pellet, how fast does a flame spread over a certain combustible surface, uh, how long can a plaster wall resist a temperature of 750 degrees Celsius and things like that. They had no knowledge or research at all about fire dynamics or fire fighting or uh, um, uh, even, you know, sprinkler science was uh, uh, always a question of uh, how much water did the sprinkler head deliver. And that was, if it delivered a lot, it was a good sprinkler head. If if it delivered a little, it was a bad sprinkler head, you know. So there was really, the academic world was not into firefighting at all at the time. It was all about fire efficiency for combustion or fire prevention. Yeah, and classifying combustible materials and, you know, to make um, fire prevention in buildings that way. But uh, when we're talking about firefighting, they were not active at all, because there has not been any financial funds for that, you know. So the the firefighters uh, can, could relate and, and connect to Christer and his his ideas, like yeah. like you did when you yeah. came to school. Yeah. So I was on that side of the line. Oh, yeah. this guy is not uh, bullshitting. We can understand what he's saying, and I can relate to it uh, from my previous experience. Um, on the other side of the line you had the uh, establishment you know, and the um, establishment is a lot of things. It is the, uh, of course the management of the school but it's also the senior officers in your own fire department that uh, uh, had another formal way of learning their trade and um, um, workers' unions that said, oh, no, 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 don't let experiment, don't do experiment with our lives. Uh, no, 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 take it easy here. Uh, this has been good for 20 years, it's good for another 20 years. Uh, so establishment is, uh, is a complicated construction w with a lot of ingredients. You know. So how so, is, so if the establishment, uh, with, you know, senior command, yeah. higher yeah. officers, the, yeah. the, the schools. First off, how was it for you as a firefighter when you got back from fire school with, with new theories about why things yeah. happen? Was there... Uh, First off, was there a, you know, a, a clear link between what the theories you learned in school mm -hmm. and actual behavior on the fire ground? You know, did, mm -hmm. did Christer say, this is the theory, this is this, this links to these specific actions on the fire ground? Or was it more like you understood more, but you, did, you, you acted the same when you got back to your fire department? Mm, uh, no, we... Um um, we had to uh, act the same in a way because we had still had the same equipment, you know, when we came back, and we still have the uh, establishment, you know. And if um, we brought in something very new and uh, uh, contradictive to what uh, was common, they, oh, they would say, "This is circus." acts, you know, this is not firefighting, oh no, 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 we'll do it the way we used to do it, and, uh, you know, all kinds of, of resistance. Um, 
which I think we must realize that uh, most fire departments all over the world is uh, an organization where you go through the ranks to be a, to become a superior commander. Um, and uh, in such organization, it's more like um, it's a more of the same organization and if you can deliver more of the same you go through the ranks and uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are developing the organization so you so you got Christer you know uh, spurred some new ideas some new theories in yourself and other firefighters um, but it wasn't that much of a difference in practical terms when you go back to fire departments in, in changing behaviors and, and equipment, right? No, that was a problem for many of our students. Uh, they uh, came back with uh, new knowledge that could be uh, very well established, but uh, it didn't fit into the more of the same organization. So, uh, going back to the school, you met Christer, and how how did you end up, and then you, you went through the school, you met him, you hear his theories, how did you end up working with Christer? Uh, because uh, my, my big interest was to uh, erase all phenomenons and explain them. I, um, I hate phenomenons. I don't believe in ghosts. And then we started to uh, uh, investigate things. You know. uh, could be very simple things like the lower explosion level, upper the explosion level. Why, why is it like that? What, what's the mechanism behind this? And uh, um, uh, how can you manipulate this mechanism? And uh, uh, also, how can you show it to your students, uh, uh, questions like this. And we, we found out very soon that, well, we really have to, to write about this, to make new books about this, uh, um, to get it spread, because we cannot always word fight with everybody, you know, we, we have to write it down. Uh, and if we write it down, all the facts there is there for everybody to see and to scrutinize our facts and see if if we are wrong or right or um, have interpreted those facts wrong or whatever. Uh, uh, so we agree both. We're gonna make we're gonna start write books uh, about this, and already from day one we decided that. This book is going to be read by the volunteer fireman, and he is supposed to understand this, but still it has to be technically correct. So uh, when we were uh, writing books, we used 80% of the time, sorry, 20% uh, of the time to gather facts and to uh, uh, understand things about those facts and we used 80% of the time to to uh, put this into simple words that everybody could read. So uh, the academic world sometimes think that oh, well your books are not so very academic. No, thank you, they're not. But they're very technical correct. So when was the first, what was the first, uh, what was the first piece you made together with Christer? What was the first actual, you know, longer book? Uh, we made the first uh, book, um, um, 1977 came this uh, first book about fire science, explaining a few things about fire dynamics, flashovers, gas explosions, smoke gas explosions self-ignition, uh, fire behavior, 
um, a few things like that. It came 77, yes. And what was the kind of the key misconceptions that you wanted to teach back then, 77? The working situation for the smoke divers in Sweden is that you go deep inside to a building through smoke gases to find the initial fire. Uh, then you got to know your, for yourself as you are proceeding inside. What does the smoke look like when they're prone to flash over? What are the signs to, uh, that it is going to flash over in, 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 in a few seconds? Um, what do I do? What do I do if I see the fire gases are prone to flash over? Do I wait or what action do I take? Um, what action is effective if they are prone to uh, flash over? Things like that. And well, what kind of the key findings did you want to teach? You know? Yeah, the key findings is that you are uh, you are very basically you're very afraid of uh, fire gassing gases flashing over. But when you are very near to the upper explosion level, the uh, mixture is very very vulnerable to cooling, and maybe you could just. Uh, cool it a little bit there, and then it will not flash over. And we know what does it look like when it is prone to flash over. Uh, well, it is a very turbulent smoke, but still there is no open flame in it. But if you let it keep on turbulating, there will soon be a flame in it. Okay, so you will just attack it and cool it a little bit just before that. Huh? But the only way you had to do that in the 70s was to find a hot surface and create steam. Yes. And uh, so we were not very satisfied with uh, the effectiveness of uh, the tools that we had. But then we had a, we had a great luck, big luck, because um, uh, there was a Swedish institution making a survey, asking, uh, the Swedish uh, uh, rescue services, what do you need to do a better job? And I asked every rescue service in Sweden. And uh, we said, we need a nozzle that can cool smoke gases. Uh, we also had a few other ideas that were actually realized too, but um, now we'll stick to the topic. <laughs> and. Um, uh, it took only a couple of weeks and then there was one Swedish company that it was actually yeah, the leading company making firefighting nozzles in Sweden, the TA Hydronics. And they, um, they understood our question or request. So they contacted us and said, okay, uh, what do you need? Oh, what should it look like? And they involved us in the um, developing of a new smoke diver's nozzle for, for Sweden. And we could set all the design criteria and all the, uh, the, all the capacity criteria, even the color what it should be, and uh, uh, to make sure that we were knowing what we were requesting, we were asking all the, all the students in, in the fire academy. So they filled in a form, you know, a wishing list for a firefighter's nozzle. We had over 200 of those filled uh, in lists, and then we formulated, these are the criteria that we want. Can you make it? Uh, what, what was the date when that, you know, that request sheet was handed over to Tour and Anderson? Now we're talking 77, 78. 78, that was the day yeah. you started with the yeah. process of developing. Yeah. 
What was, if we go to back in time again, uh, was the terms like hot rich flashover, you know, uh, flashover, were those terms uh, developed by you and Christer then? Yes, it was in the first booklet. Yeah. So, Fire Science of uh, 1977. Which we, of course, we made a edition 77, we made another edition 78 and 79 and improved it a little bit, uh, but it was there from 77. So what was, when you wrote the specification sheet for we need something to de deal with fire gases, yes. we need something yep. to cool gases, what, what was, besides the actual practical properties like you know how the handles should look mm. like and all the triggers how did you know how to design the nozzle in terms of what you wanted to achieve in you know we talk about droplet size mm -hmm. velocity flow mm -hmm. patterns all those things how did you know what mm -hmm. to specify to an anderson um first of all there are uh, was a big job done by um, uh, a guy named Otto Hertrich. He was German and he presented in 1956 uh, his book uh, named Wasser als Löschmittel, also water as extinguishing agent. And he has made a lot of tests and saying that uh, the, the best droplet size for fighting interior fires would be one third of a millimeter. Uh, and it, it was a compromise. Um, smaller drops would actually cool uh, fire gases even better. But then on the other hand, you needed to have some mass in the drop so you could throw it into the flames and, and the hot gases. And uh, mostly, uh, empirically, he, he uh, presented is that one third of a millimeter is, is the aim. How, how did you and in, 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 in Christer decide that that was accurate? That was, you know, that sounds good. By, by practical tests, okay. yeah. We actually, uh, there was no such nozzle at the time uh, on the market, not anywhere, but there were nozzles for uh, humidizing uh, laundry in laundry shops and uh, other industri uh, industrial applications. Um, the problem with those nozzles was they, they were for like three liters per minute. So we had to put together a nozzle with uh, 20 of those small nozzles. It, it, looked, it looked really awkward and ugly, you know, but we did that and we tested it. So actually... Against flames or, or against definite, yes, gases? definitely. And then we needed a pump um, because those nozzles worked as a, and with a very much higher nozzle pressure than, than um, uh, firefighting nozzles. So we had to have a pump uh, and a water pump for 300 bars. And then we had to have a diesel engine to run this water pump. And uh, actually we were extinguishing uh, two by two meters, a square meter, four square meters of gasoline with only water using 20 liters per minute. The water droplets were uh, as small as the uh, powder grains. So uh, at that size of water droplets, it doesn't matter if you're using water or if you're using powder grains, they're just as effective. What um, was, uh, first of starting, if, if you made such small droplets with you know 300 bars, um, how did you make it work in terms of throwing di the throwing distance? Oh, they don't throw at all. It's more like a fog coming out or a mist coming out of the of the nozzle. So you have to have the wind in your back and or, and uh, put uh, all those water drops where the fire is sucking in the uh, surrounding air. 
otherwise you don't get them into the flames. So that but, was... But, but still we confirmed that the smaller water droplet really works. But, you, but then uh, with that nozzle you created even smaller oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. droplets than yeah. 0.3. Yeah. But um, uh, by empirically we could understand that okay these drops are very effective because they're so small but on the other hand uh, to use them in our working situation for smoke divers you need to be able to throw them in for a couple of meters at least and then you need a little bit big, bigger droplets. So, so basically when, uh, when we started to work with TI hydronics the question was actually how small droplets can you make from a nozzle pressure of six bars? Uh, they couldn't make it 0 0.1 millimeter, but they could make it one third of a millimeter. And then again, the droplet diameters from leaving a nozzle are never homogen. They're not all of the same size. Of course, there are some smaller, some bigger, some is what you aim for. But we created a, a nozzle together with TA Hydronics that had the uh, one third of a millimeter, a lot of the drops were one third of a millimeter. And even more drops were 0 0.1 millimeter, but the volume of water creating those small drops were uh, uh, very much less than those who created a third of, of a millimeter. And then there were some drops that were even up to a millimeter, but still the uh, vast amount of droplets were a third of a millimeter or less. So you, you, one was then going back to the two by two petrol fire, mm -hmm. you just, which you distinguish it 20 liters mm -hmm. per minute. Uh, what was, was there any reaction from the firefighting community in Sweden or the, the authorities at the school about those, those trials you made? Or was that more that you did for your own sake for designing the fog knives? We fog did it for our own sake, but I must admit there was uh, nobody was really interested to come and see it. So uh, when we told them we could, we extinguish gasoline with just water, small droplets. Are. We don't believe you. That was the reaction. So you took those findings uh, uh, about droplet sizes and you to two and how how. How does the how does the relationship between those droplets, the distance between the different droplets, how does that play a part in, in suppressing a fire? And and was that something you specified also that yep. you needed a certain amount of droplets per per volume? Yeah, it was. Um, uh, and that was also um, actually very simple because um, uh, you had this coal miner's lamp uh, developed in the uh, 1850s or whatever. Uh, later also it's called the Davis net on uh, explosion proof uh, vessels for that you contains gasoline or something. Um, and uh, that was uh, another part of, of science, you know, because if you had a net around the flame and the net uh, had a mesh size and thread size of the right kind, the flame could not pass out through the net and ignite the gas surrounding it. And that's a phenomenon. No? So uh, as we don't believe in phenomenon, so how come? And basically, we found out that uh, uh, the cross in the net mesh could represent the water drop. And if you have the water drops tight enough, the flame will not pass through. And uh, that again uh, depends on a very basic physical law. 
uh, about how atoms are moving in the atmosphere. So if you have a droplet here and a flame cannot come all the way and touch the surface of the water drop, there is always a gap between the water drop and the flame because the water drop cools out the reaction that causes the flame from a certain distance. And then if you can make the water drop so tight that these distances overlap, there is no chance for the flame to come out and ignite the gas or different too, the gas cannot come in and ignite and increase the flame, whatever. So the, the, the distance between water drops was, um, is very imperial to make sure that a flame cannot pass the spray pattern that you are releasing from your nozzle. Actually, we found out the uh, exact distance and, and so in a laboratory using propane flame gas and different nets and mesh. Of, we had bought 40 different kinds and then by just testing over this propane flame, you could say the distance should be around maximum this and then it will work. And then on the other hand, when you have made the first prototype, we will of course taste it, uh, test it on a propane flame, see what happens. Because if it can stop a propane flame, it can stop a flame from smoke gases, because it's less energy rich. Why is it that the Davis net works? Uh, the Davis net Every cross of the mesh in the Davis net uh, works like a water drop. And the thing is that a flame cannot come all the way to the surface of a water drop or a cold metal surface. There is always a little distance in between where uh, the uh, oxidation process in the flame is extinguished. Why? Uh, depends on the atomic middle way length when it travels around like this. Um, so, uh, uh, and the atomics, they travel, uh, when they travel to a cold place, they cannot get excited, so <laughs> then the fire goes out. So. There is always a little cold <coughs> space between the surface of the droplet. The droplet may be, say, 15 degrees plus, and the flame is 800 degrees plus. So between 15 and 800, there is a little area that is extinguished there. And then, to make a Davis net work, you got to have the mesh so tight that these extinguished areas overlap. If the mesh is too wide, flame goes through. If the mesh is too... Uh, the threads are too thin, they heat up very fast and when they're not cooling any longer, the flame goes through and so forth. So empirically we found um, a good uh, measure that will prevent the flame from going through. And we told the TA Hydronics that uh, you can do this uh, any way you want, but we're going to test it in a, on a propane flame once we have the first prototype working. And we tested this and um, uh, the flame get, didn't go through. Was it? What's the difference between the? And going back to the firefighter, the <coughs> very flat protection cone angle. Yep. And when you go a bit more narrow, it becomes. What's the difference between the hollow cone and the filled cone? Yeah. Uh, we we chosen uh, deliberately on the fog fighter to make a hollow cone. 
because if you attack a, a flame front and you have a solid uh, cone, the cone presses out the flame like this in front of you, like opening doors, but they can also close behind you. A hollow cone has basically a vacuum uh, in the middle that sucks the flame into the middle like this. So it's more like it's closing doors in front of you. And um, the hollow cone uh, traps the flame and, and if your droplet size is tight enough it will keep trapped within the hollow cone. So you can actually take a flame, you can grab it and you can move it a bit on the side like this. With a solid cone or a filled cone, uh, you cannot do this because you can only push the way the flames in front of you in those directions. And when you approach a little bit deeper, they can come around the cone and come around back of you. So in my opinion, it should be a hollow cone, very tight between the droplet sizes, so the flames cannot penetrate through your protective screen. So what happens if the volume you're in is bigger than your protective screen can cover? You can, of course, get overwhelmed. Uh, but uh, when we're talking about uh, flames from a flashover in an apartment, which is 100 square meters and two and a half meter between the floor and the roof, um, it cannot pass you. What, what's, the, what's the practical limit uh, of that kind of nozzle? Uh, the practical limit is actually what you can see, uh, how far the screen reaches out when you are uh, spraying it out. Um, which means it's about two and a half meters that direction and two hundred meters, two and a half meters that direction. And then a radius of two and a half meters. If it is five meters, it can pass outside of the screen and come in your back. <coughs> so, uh, going back to, we talked about the droplet size, we talked about the distances between the droplets. Um, then we go to flow. Yeah. So what, what made you specify the fog fighters flow on 100 and 300 liters per minute, those two settings? What was the reasons for those specifications? Yeah, you know, the, there is only two very simple reasons. Uh, the 300 liter is uh, what you need if you are going to meet an excessive or aggressive flame coming towards you with a pressure. Uh, and, and the 100 liters per minute is uh, just for um, uh, when you really want to save water, you don't want the floor to get wet. So now we're talking about small things. Small flames, small things. Um, and the reason why we didn't go higher uh, in flow, uh, more than 300 liters per minute, are exact, uh, exactly two. Uh, one is that it's not necessary in the situation where you are smoke diving in, in apartments. Um, you don't really need more than that. And um, two is that in Sweden we use a very narrow, fine uh, hose system behind the smoke divers. It's only a one and a half inch hose. So um, uh, you also have to limit the uh, water volumes because of the hose system. If the standard Swedish hose back in the day in the 70s would have been 
like say one inch and three quarters or maybe even two inch would you have specified a higher maximum flow on the file fighter no not really and um, knowing what i know today is that we could perhaps settle for less maybe 250 liters or maybe even as low as 200 liters but because it's enough in interior firefighting. How did you settle to the, the, the opinion or, or um, fact, depending how you look at it, that 200 or 250 or 300 liters per minute is enough? Is it calculated? Is it measured? Is it trial tested? Is it experimental? How, how did you settle on those numbers? It is trial tested to maintain the distance between drops and also the volume of drops coming out. Um, there is no scientific calculation behind this. It's done in the laboratories of the TA hydronics. So it's, it's, it's based on that with the droplet size you, you tested and yeah. the distance between the droplets yeah. that's the flow you needed to create that kind of mesh yeah. in the dis in the volume you need yes and since nothing can burn within that volume the, the volume you mm. add those, those no flames can no pass through no flames screen. can pass mm -hmm. through you deemed that that would be enough for interior firefighting? Yeah, we tested that in, in laboratories using propane gas towards uh, the nozzle fixed in a fixture. So, would the, if that would be the case, that it, let's say that that is absolutely correct, would the, the need to increase flow, would, would there be a need to increase flow to, for instance, get a, a larger amount of, of droplets over a bigger surface, bigger volume. That's for instance, if we go up in volume and say it's not an apartment, it's a big, it's a big mansion. Would the need for a higher flow then exist? Can. Uh, there is always situations, um, bigger mansions or outside in a gas station or whatever that could uh, require a higher amount, but um, uh, our problem in Sweden at the time was interior firefighting in apartments and doing that efficiently. So that's what it's designed for. What you could do if you uh, have a situation um, in a gas station or whatever is that you attack with two nozzles. So, so um, uh, we never aim to create the nozzle for all purposes. It's basically for interior fighting, firefighting by smoke divers. That's one of the reasons why we don't have a handle on it. You can get it with a handle, but uh, the original version has no handle. Because with a handle you need one hand to hold it, one hand to open and close, and one hand to adjust the spray pattern. Huh? And uh, our smoke divers only have two hands. So we don't have a handle, and we expect to be low, not standing up and then you have all the functions in your two hands. So how do you deal with the nozzle reaction? Uh, by having a large rubber buffer that supports your hand when you open the nozzle. That's why it looks like it looks like. That's the flow. Uh, so let's talk about the individual parts of the fog fight because it's, 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 uh, it's fun. Uh, how did the discussion go? Russ, that's that TNA, uh, Torn Anderson decision to go with the kind of the slide valve uh, in comparison to the more traditional ball valve. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was uh, pretty easy because a ball valve 
closes the flow very abruptly. And if you close the valve very abruptly, you get this uh, dynamic uh, pressure raise in the hose. The water is rushing towards the nozzle and then you close the uh, valve and then all this water have to stop. And if you have two lengths of um, hose behind you, uh, you have around uh, 100 kilos of water uh, rushing towards the nozzle and you stop it right like that. That puts some real strain on the hose system. So what we wanted was a valve that closes a little bit clo uh, smoother than just a ball valve that abruptly clo uh, closes the, the uh, flow. So that's what you have this uh, the valve is designed like a parrot's beak and it closes like this. So you have to go all the way to close before the valve is closed. With the traditional ball valve it, you more cut off the flow like this. It would have been uh, a slide valve actually that would have been perfect you know to close it really slow. But uh, <coughs> optimizing the nozzle, it was an adjusted or modified ball valve to close it. Uh, and <coughs> then you had the the big bumper. So mm -hmm. what was the what was the thought going into the bumper and the how you adjust the nozzle pattern? Uh, the the whole idea is that we have two hands. And um, uh, if you are doing interior firefighting, first of all, you cannot read any numbers on nozzles uh, showing what volume are we on now. So we put the, valve, um, the volume regulation in the ball valve. You open and 200 and if you click past that, you go to 300 immediately. <coughs> also, when you close it, it clicks at 100 and then you close it. And uh, then we only had a little knob so you could feel it through, even if you have gloves in your hands. So you could feel it. Is the knob standing right up? You have this good uh, uh, nozzle angle for smoke gas cooling, but then you can also uh, increase it or close it a little bit. Uh, you don't even have to change the grip, it's all in your hand there. So that's why it's, it's a little go-kart feeling in this. You open it and you close very quick. But um, if you have a Ferrari, you got to learn to drive it, you know. So you have to learn those handling maneuvers. So what was the what was the reason for and why why uh, why did you decide to go with a spinning tooth ring? Uh, that decision was actually taken by the manufacturer, uh, but we said you can do it any way you want it as long as we get the close distance between drops and the small droplets. If you can do it without uh, uh, a moving tooth ring, it's very good. If you cannot, you put the moving tooth ring there. So what cone angle is the tooth ring engaged and what does it do? Um, it's, uh, with this uh, disc nozzles, uh, the, it's not like a smooth bore where you have a solid, clear uh, beam coming out is a uh, hollow middle, however, any way you do it. But uh, it's rather incredible because they throw the same throw length, um, both the solid beam and this uh, disc nozzles. Actually, it's, the difference is uh, not noticeable at six bars. Um, and then, you really need the um, smooth bore or the high impact created by a, 
a solid beam. When you are to flush away glass or stone or liquids or whatever from a road, for instance, um, and then you need smaller droplet size for um, extinguishing fires. So they grip in already at 15 degrees like this. Then the teeth come in and they start dividing up the water into small droplets. How could you else, how do you create small droplets? What kind of options do you have? Well, <clears throat> first of all, there is only one source of energy to create the small droplets, and that is the nozzle pressure. The pressure in the water uh, at the point where the water leaves the nozzle. What the nozzle really does is to take the nozzle pressure, say for instance six bars, and after the water leaves the nozzle, the pressure is atmospheric because there is no residue pressure left after this. Uh, if that was the case, the uh, water would uh, kind of uh, explode out in the free air because it was still pressure in the water when it left the nozzle. But the nozzle device is a device that takes down the nozzle pressure from six bar to atmospheric pressure. Zero bar, which is not existent, but um, six bars less than what you have in the nozzle pressure. And <coughs> this energy um, in the nozzle is transformed from pressure to kinetic energy, to speed. And this speed is all you have, that's all the energy you have to use in some way to mortal the water, to, uh, to chop up the water into small droplets. And then you need a couple of devices there that helps this happen. And um, a toothed ring with very sharp edges and that also um, uh, rotates uh, is the best device known so far that can do this. There are other means that you can do it. Um, uh, one mean is uh, uh, ultrasonic sound, but then again you need some electrical connections and some more devices in the nozzle to do it. So uh, it was not very optional for us. Uh, but actually, the uh, hydraulic specialists at the TA Hydronics choose this method to create those drops and droplet distances we had in the criteria by designing this ring, which has very, very sharp edges, if you have noticed. So if it gets, what was the maintenance problem with the fog, fog nozzle, or the fog fighter? Uh, the maintenance was uh, more than the regular nozzle, which is a disadvantage, of course. Uh, it was mostly uh, because uh, the fog fighter had also an um, uh, automatic pressure device inside of it. So if you had any kinks on the hose or any other reason, any obstruction in the floor, uh, any obstruction in the flow or uh, any other obstructions that lower the nozzle pressure, the nozzle self-adjusted uh, and maintained the nozzle pressure. Uh, so you could create those small drops and small distances. In a regular nozzle, if you have an obstruction in the flow or uh, anything that takes down the nozzle pressure, uh, all you get is larger drops 
uh, shorter throw length and everything. It can look like a um, retired man's pissing in the toilet. But uh, the fog fighter then created a smaller nozzle opening so it could maintain the nozzle pressure and maintain those small drops. And of course, that device uh, needed um, some kind of service and some kind of care. Could, of course, also break down, even if it was a very simple device. Uh, but still, it was a more complicated nozzle than the regular disc nozzles that is on the market today. What? Uh, how much? Uh, I mean, uh, looking at it, uh, is it possible for the firefighter to to know that we, for instance, have a kink in the hose line that's affecting the flow so much? Uh, uh, pressure uh, which reduces the flow to the nozzle. Is it possible for the fire to, fire to know that he's not getting the 300 liters per minute he's expecting, he's getting a lot less? Is it possible to know? No, it's not. That's uh, why we wanted this device. It could be as simple as uh, suddenly you have a hose leak on the way up to the smoke divers. And that hose leak is um, uh, 30 meters behind them. How can I know? Or the hose is kinking in the staircase up uh, when you're filling the hose. Looks good in, a be in the beginning and then suddenly the hose is twisted a little bit more and then you get an obstruction in the flow there. How can I know? So is, is it a concern that they might go inside with much less flow than they anticipate? Yes, that's a concern. That can happen. All you need is a leakage on the hose on the way up. You left the design suggestions to Tour and Anderson in, in 77 for the, for the fog fighter. Yeah, it was a little later, 79. 79, sorry, sorry, 79. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, so after 79, you were working on, uh, you were working for Malmö Fire Department still? No, or? I was a fire officer in the um, uh, fire department of Norrköping, that's uh, mid-Sweden. Yeah. And that's where you, that's where you took out the fire, uh, the fog fighter uh, series one or a uh, series zero, you know, mm. before production and mm -hmm. take out and trialed it. How did you mm. trial it? We trialed it uh, basically by uh, putting houses on fire and um, using regular furniture, uh, using the regular situation you had in a bungalow fire or apartment fire. And we were so lucky uh, during those days because uh, we had so many, many houses that we could uh, burn down. Uh, the Swedish Air Force has changed to from uh, the Dragon to the Viggen, which is, Viggen is a very much bigger aircraft and a lot bigger engine and a lot noisier. So uh, there was areas where people had to move out and, and leave their houses and uh, so the Air Force had to buy their houses and, and send the people that lived there away and we said just keep the house intact, close all doors, close all windows and we can burn it down for you for a very cheap amount of money. <laughs> Uh, so we had a lot of houses uh, available for burning, yes. So from the first suggestion from Tour Anderson, how, how many pro was there any big changes to their prototype you made during, before the first production model went into service? Uh, no, when you see it from my point of view, I specified the criteria what it should be able to do. And they worked very hard to fulfill the criteria. 
and um, uh, the basic design was followed, but that was very easy because we wanted a nozzle that could be uh, operated with a person using big gloves and things like that, you know. Uh, and without even seeing the nozzle, they should feel what it was doing. And um, uh, their big job was to make the drawings and all the design of the nozzle so it would fit their factory. Because they had these uh, automatic machines that were working all night. And um, then uh, the production was so automatic and automatized that uh, uh, their big job was to uh, do all the drawing so it could be automatized for the factory. So, um, and um, in that respect, I had no objections at all, you know, <laughs> as long as they produced what I wanted to have. So, uh, continue the process of looking at nozzles. You visited Inderschutz 2015, right? Yes, that it is. Uh, and something. you had a, a, a small, interesting question with the nozzle manufacturers today. Yes, I was very puzzled because uh, today this is not an issue. When I asked the guys, uh, independent of what factory or what company that was manufacturing those nozzles where they came from. Uh, I asked them, what's the droplet size from this nozzle? And they really didn't have any idea. But then, okay, I said, what's the, um, what's the um, uh, droplet diameter of this nozzle? Uh, they had no idea. Okay, uh, is there any uh, pressure automatic in this device? So if you get your hose kinched or whatever, it maintains the nozzle pressure. Uh, they didn't know what I was talking about. You know. uh, I had visited at least 15 stands and same results in all stands, except for one, South Korea. The South Koreans knew exactly what they were talking about because they were uh, basically a, a manufacturing um, uh, high fog sprinklers. And as a side business, they were manufacturing nozzles. So they had a nozzle that had 0 0.1, uh, one-third uh, of a millimeter in droplet size. Uh, and distance was also one millimeter, uh, sorry, sorry, one-tenth of a millimeter. Uh, but they needed uh, 100 bars and 20 liters per minute. And this nozzle looked exactly what we had tested to extinguish gasoline with water in 1977. Mm -hmm. So you're... It's totally <laughs> unsellable. <laughs> <laughs> but um, are you looking at the, the nozzles used today? Do you think that just... Do you think that they might have, have tested, don't know what you're talking about, but they're still producing good droplets. Or do you think that, do you think that the droplet sizes are simply too big today? Um, of course, these guys I met, they were the sellers. And the sellers are not technicians. But uh, interviewing them, I had a hunch that uh, this is not an issue today, droplet size automatic pressure devices or distances between drop droplets. Because if it was a selling argument, of course, they would have known. But um, I don't, I simply think this is not an issue. It's not something the customer demands. 
Well, of course. <laughs> if the customer would demand it, if, in other words, the fire service, they would have asked for it. The only thing I can say, the fog fighter was totally orange, a signal color. So if you drop it or uh, in a fire room where everything is black, you will have something with a, a very uh, different color so you can find it immediately. But what I could see on today's nozzle is that the handle is fluorescent green or yellow or something that uh, the rest is black. So uh, we have done some uh, prosperous things here because uh, there is a signal color at the nozzles, at, uh, at, at least. Some nozzles. We're at some nozzles, yeah. We're getting somewhere, really, yeah. Uh. Okay, so how long did it take before, if 1979 you left the tour, Anderson, when was the first production model out for sale? Uh, 1981. 1981. Yeah, they needed uh, almost three years to um, develop the product and to adjust this to their just into their factory uh, production. You know. Okay, so now you had a tool that could do the thing that you had wished for, which yeah. was to able to to not only address the surface uh, of the fire, mm -hmm. which is the direct attack, or surface to create steam, an indirect mm -hmm. attack, or uh, but you have also a way to directly, without using any surfaces, address the gaseous problem, which is the yep. flames or the gases. Yeah. How did the work go as first of you figuring out how to use this as a method, as a technique, you know, skills based? How to first mm -hmm. did that development and later on, how was this, you know, received by the fire departments, the <clears> fire, <throat> the firefighters, <throat> but the fire departments and how long did the transition take from the, the smooth bore approach to the gas cooling approach as a standard method for for the, for the approach part of going to fire. Yeah. It's, 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 I think it's clear here it's saying that, I mean, we still, you would still have to fight the fire and putting the wet, the, the wet stuff on the red stuff when you see the fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was to mitigate the problem of, of gases on, on route to the fires mm -hmm. in the compartment. So how would, uh, how was the development of that method, you know, taking place and how, how did, was it received? Well, f first of all, uh, now you can put the wet stuff in the smoking stuff and um, uh, that can save your life. So uh, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, again, you find the line, you know, between the early acceptors, those who had been to the fire school, and that was a couple of thousand guys already, and then they had a theory, but they didn't have the tool. And now the tool came. So of course they said, wow, 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 we gotta buy this one. This is the real thing. Well, and then on the other side of the line, you have those, no, come on, we had the smooth bore muscles for 20 years, and they're still good, you know. There is still no fires going on that we haven't extinguished yet. Uh, uh, you know, this type of arguments that you, of course, can't deny even if they're not true. Uh. So there was um, always uh, two sides of the line, you know, the early acceptors that no knew they were, they were going to go further uh, with this new tool and those who couldn't see the value of this new tool. Well, uh, yeah. but one thing that disappointed me very much that they were so, all of them agreed, but it's so heavy. It's so heavy, they said, yes. And if you have a smooth bore nozzle and cast alloy, uh, and compare that to a uh, disc nozzle with the pressure automatics and uh, uh, with uh, actually a, a bigger flow and all this. Of course, it, it has to be heavier, you know, but th that was a big issue. It's heavy. It's heavy. 
So again, you know, even the early acceptors that knew that this could you know, open up new ways of fight fires for you and give you a new safety and um, security in what you're doing, even those said it, it's heavy. Yeah, that they pick it up yeah. without a hose line pressurized yeah, yeah. and they look, oh, this is heavy compared to this. And The sellers put them on, yeah. yeah. And then it was expensiver, huh? So those who were actually taking these decisions to buy it, they could buy either uh, one fog fighter or three of the smooth bores, and you know it's a it's a hard decision. So, you know, is, is this one really three times better than three of those? Or um, yeah, so we had actually uh, an unexpected slow start. When do you think the Swedish service? You're just looking at the Swedish fire service. Mm -hmm. When do you think the Swedish fire service, kind of the majority of the fire departments in Sweden, started using the fog fighter and the the what what is then what is then called the the offensive mm -hmm. uh, fire attack, which is gas cooling and. It took us, uh, I mean, between three to five years before uh, we really had it spread and accepted. Uh, in in Sweden, so mid mid uh, mid eighties, yeah, mid eighties. Then you can say, and uh, both the manufacturer and we were so convinced we were doing the right thing. Even this unexpected resistance and uh, unexpected obstacles were there. We thought, no, 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 we're we're doing the right thing. So what do we do now to? to uh, make people accept this and uh, to overcome the uh, obstacles. So we had to write another book. And it was actually based on the same theories as the book from 77, but now it was called Extinguishing with Fog Fighter. And we explain smoke gas cooling, um, what to look for, how to do it, and all this in, in very simple words. And uh, everybody that bought the Fog Fighter became one of those books together with it. And we also made videos. Actually, we made two different videos on this one, showing flashover situations uh, and where the Fog Fighter knocked it down safely. And I believe this was the first time ever you brought uh, a camera into a fire room where firefighters were working with real fires and filmed how the fire developed and what it did when it flashed over and how they knocked it down. Very poor quality, <laughs> but <laughs> that was the v VHS cameras of the time, you know. Yeah. Uh, even the first pictures are in, in, in black and white, but then finally we, we uh, found some cameras that were in, in color and we brought them in. They were expensive like hell. They were very vulnerable to, to heat, but we brought them in and made a few films with that, yes. And that broke through. Going back to those, those um, uh, that was the mid 80s, um, if you look at the fatality rates of firefighters, mm. the, the line of duty deaths mm. in, in fires in the Swedish fire service, was that mm. something that you had in mind, you know, looking at the statistics and seeing, seeing the dramatic shift from the period before 1980 and the period after 1980? In Sweden, we never had this a problem uh, very um, um, accentuated. Uh, we're a small country and uh, sometimes there are fire, some years firefighters die, some, some years not. You really don't know. But we had a few examples where, where firefighters were trapped in a flashover and trying to fight their way out and didn't make it. And of course, if you have a new tool that can uh, uh, um, 
offer a, uh, an opportunity to fight your way out. Uh, of course, that's very important. Uh, but we're not like England or Germany or USA. You have so and so many death rates every year, and uh, it depends on this and that. And if they had this tool, they could go out. Um, the more significant thing about the whole, about this tool, was that you had a tool that could save your life. Uh, if a flashover was occur occurring, you could actually reverse it. It's like climb a, a mountain. Do you have a safety line or don't you have a safety line? That was more the if issue. Uh, so when, when did, when and how did some kind of international interest start with the Swedish way, the new Swedish way of operating, mm -hmm. and the tool which is the fog fighter. I think the European market was teased a bit with um, those videos that we made, the commercial videos that we made for fog fighter, and the commercial books that we made for fog fighter. And then there was an interest uh, abroad, and it was the Swedish um, Rescue and Firefighting Academy that had four schools in Sweden that responded and said, yeah, you can come here and do some training if you like, or see what, how we are instructing. And that drew a very uh, big interest. And, um, they got uh, orders from Spain and France and uh, uh, later also England, Great Britain, uh, to train their uh, instructors in this. And, um, and they did a good job because they came back and came back and, um, and today it's spread all over the United Kingdom, uh, some parts of the United States, and uh, many states in Europe. But I think it actually was that you had a training material, you had the books, you had the videos, you could both verify this works, and you had an, um, an instruction material so you could uh, teach it. And, um, uh, of course, also the Swedish uh, Rescue and Fire Service Agency responded and sent instructors uh, all over Europe to, uh, to do things with, uh, with other fire departments, yes. Was, do you think this, the, the, the way you, you and Christer from the beginning intended and you later developed further with like Norrköping and uh, do you think that was understood fully by those coming to Sweden? No, I, I'm so surprised it's understood now after all these years because there were no signs uh, of that uh, in the beginning, no. Uh, we had some visitors from England to Norrköping where I worked at the time. Um, but at that time the English were very skeptic, so I think it was the Swedish Rescue and Fire Agency that convinced them later on. <coughs> the, um, I remember the English uh, colleagues came first, um, and that was uh, after King's Cross accident they came and they wanted to hear a little about this but they went home again and said no 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 this is not for us so we only have one glass windows and they always break so we never have flashovers in apartments and things like that so but then they had um, they lost uh, a few colleagues in, in a fire in an office building and uh, Mm, they came back again, and then, then they were really serious. So the English, after that, has been uh, very supportive in, in this type of thinking when it comes to interior firefighting. They, they have found out that uh, even if our 
main goal is to fight the fire safe, maybe from the street. It's inevitable that sometimes you must go in, and when you go in, you get to be prepared for things. Well, well, where's the, because <clears throat> I think that what is widely still uh, connected to the fogfighter and the offensive approach uh, of gas cooling mm. is the quick pulsing. Mm. The rapid, small bursts of water mm. to cool the gases. Yeah. Where did that came from? And this is something that, you know... It's nothing that I have uh, invented. Uh, what we... Uh, it's always difficult to define what is firefighting with short pulses. For me, a pulse is uh, a second or three seconds. So, uh, because try give it a pulse because the result is immediate. Close the nozzle, check, did I get the right result? Did the neutral, uh, neutral plane raise up a bit? Did you get steam uh, uh, turbulent into the air? What happened actually after your first short pulse? Then uh, repeat it and then check again. If nothing more happens, you're on the, in the wrong place in the wrong time. So then you have to approach and then you try again, short pulse. All of this is to not use more water than necessary because maybe you will have to crawl on the floor to get out. Uh, and then you don't want a whole lot of water on the floor. Huh? Uh, from that, some instruct instructors has uh, developed a method using very short pulses, which is a half a second or a third of a second. Um, I don't personally see the value of, of this. Um, I know what they're doing, but I cannot see the value of this. Because uh, when you open the nozzle and you suddenly close it, Again, you have all this water coming in the hose towards the nozzle, and then it closes suddenly. The hose is somewhat elastic, so it blows up and it prolongs a bit. And then uh, the pump uh, raises the pressure to um, a pressure uh, it would have against closed valves. And then when all this pressure has raised up a bit, you open again and let the water go. So actually what you're doing is that you're raising the nozzle pressure in this pulse. And uh, when one, then you close again because this nozzle pressure, raised nozzle pressure is only for half a second and everything is back to normal. And then you close again, and then the pump starts to raise the pressure, and the hose expands a bit and prolongs a bit, and then you open and lets out the water again, and, on, and so forth. That puts an enormous strain on the hose system. Uh, more strain than if you would only raise the pump pressure and go on as normal, in my opinion. Uh, so they're, they're doing the short pulses. And with the with one of the objectives of that is to increase the nozzle pressure. Yeah. So what would if that if it's if the normal pressure is about six bars at the nozzle with this traditional Swedish hose system built up where the yeah. pump is at ten bars, uh, what would be the potential pressure at the nozzle doing so, and would that affect you know droplet sizes or throw lengths of droplets or the distance between the droplets in any positive way? Mm, well, um, the pump is also designed so that the maximum pressure at closed valves is uh, 15 bars. So you can only raise the pressure at the pump to 15 bars and that means that you're coming up 30% at the nozzle. Uh, more is physically not possible. And 30% at the nozzle doesn't really make any difference. Uh, if you want to uh, cut the droplet sizes into half, 
you need to have to go from six bar to sixty bars. If you want to take those into halves, you have to go from sixty to six hundred bars. So uh, just an, an increase of uh, pressure with thirty percent uh, really has no value. So the the increase in, in pressure at nozzle is doing so is really insignificant. In my opinion, yes, uh, but it puts a very hard strain on the hose because the hose will start jumping and moving back and forth. So um, getting a hole in the hose is uh, more likely and risky with that method. So I would prefer not to do it. One argument for the pulsing was also that you would disturb the smoke layer less. No, you disturb the smoke layer, but um, you also need time to see the effect of the disturbance, what I was talking about earlier. So give it a short pulse, which is one to three seconds. See what happens. You don't have the chance to see what happens in half a second. What was the, let's say you have a, a, a bit of a larger, like a, like a common area place like this, and you want to cool that one. Mm -hmm. Did you do, uh, you know, a, like a two second pulse in this area of the place, and this is two second in this place, or would you do a sweep where you move the nozzle from one, one side to the, the other? The main objective uh, when you want to cool the smoke gases, uh, and now I'm talking about warm smoke gases, hot. Uh, is to let the drops travel as long way as possible through the smoke. Meaning that I am uh, elevating my nozzle so I get the longest traveling way through the smoke. And if it's a square room, I will of course sweep it from one side to another in, in a pulse of maximum three seconds. If it's a narrow corridor, I will of course not sweep it, just keep it straight. So, but for me, the only thing that counts is let the droplet travel as far as possible through the hot smoke, because that is what does the thing. Uh, sweeping is a question of distribution. How about air entrainment? You know, mm -hmm. that air is entrained into the does the added is it possible that you entrain for instance oxygen and actually feed the fire uh, i think i have succeeded once or twice actually in my whole life and that is uh, having very uh, good uh, carbureted gases and very close to me and shooting it up with uh, introducing a lot of air injected by the nozzle, uh, but it is v very, very seldom seen because um, as long as the water droplets travels through the smoke, it doesn't really matter if it cold air comes in and mixes to the fire gases because they also cool the warm gases. So. To give a, a short answer of your question, yes, it can happen very locally and near to your nozzle, but no, it's not a problem. Um, when when you do that, when you like saying you do a three second pulse, uh, doesn't this stir the smoke layer? So the stir the smoke layer comes down to the bottom of the the floor. If you hit hot surfaces by the end of the long travel of the drops. You can have both smoke gas, smoke gas cooling and the layman method. And if the layman method uh, at this, during those special circumstances, uh, gives a better outcome, uh, of course the smoke, the smoke layer will sink. But uh, then again, remember, it depends on that it is water steam that has turbulated into and inerted the, the gases. 
Uh, on the other hand, if that's only a, a minor uh, contribution to the extinguishing phase, and the smoke gas cooling is the uh, dominant factor, the smoke layer will raise anyway. Uh, is, it, is it possible, and did you ever, uh, going back to the 80s, did you ever talk about flow paths or air track where air currents move back and forth? Not really, because our, uh, our uh, fundamental um, position is that we go into an apartment windows intact. The only air inlet is actually in the door where you are entering yourself. Uh, so no, not a big issue for us. Uh, going back to your time, the early days with Christer and, and the teaching at the school and even also later, but primarily early, what was kind of the, the small practical teaching tools that you developed to actually teach fire behavior and, and firefighting? What kind of, you know, how did you get through to the, to the, to firefighters? Oh yeah. Uh, first of all, we um, uh, invented a little bang box. Uh, a little box with a cork on top of it and a spark plug on the side so that we could test the uh, lower and upper explosion level. Um, so we could just put a few drops of gasoline in, put the cork on and then try the spark plug and to see how many drops it takes to reach the lower explosion level and then we could repeat this and actually write this uh, curve down between uh, lower and upper explosion level. We also added some oxygen to see what um, an increased level of oxygen could do. Uh, very amazing because we shot this cork uh, uh, through the ceiling uh, several times to the amusement of all the students there. Uh, we also built the, um, uh, the uh, flashover aquarium, which was an aquarium, glass on all sides. On top there was uh, lids that opened at overpressure, so we actually didn't create any overpressure in the box, only a little, but then the lids on top lifted. And then there was a, a little opening on the side that we can open and close. And we overcarburated the atmosphere inside there with um, propane gas, actually. And then we had a source of ignition inside and a little fan to mix it all very good. And then we could open at the side and see what happened when we let in air. And then we could show them the the um, flashover, um, the regular flashover uh, in, in this aquarium. Uh, we did a lot of experiments with oxygen and different kinds of fuels and things in the laboratory. Uh, but I think basically the bang box and the aquarium was the good tools to get um, firemen to understand uh, the properties of, uh, of uh, the behavior of combustible gases in, in, in confined spaces. Who was the, who was the, who started with the Kurtuls on Lodana, the small behavior boxes? Uh, I mean the the wooden boxes. Yeah, the wooden boxes. Yeah. The small the small houses. Sander, high school Sander. We never used them actually. Okay. Uh, so they were the ones who. You know, that's an a de development yeah. of, on, on top of our development of things. Uh, tell me about uh, dry chem. What was your deal with dry chem and 
when when and, did when did this, when did dry cam became widely used in Sweden and and what was your deal with with the with the theory behind how dry cam works? Yeah, the, during the eighties, uh, there were some fire departments in Sweden that use dry cam ago for the initial attack just to uh, knock down the fire. Um, uh, while waiting for the regular smoke divers to arrive and arrange with the hoses and things so they could do a regular attack. And it works, it, and it really works good for knocking down flames, but the time you earn uh, is very, very short. Um, and I think they gave it up because of the uh, time was too sh that you earned were too short. Because once the uh, the uh, the powder has laid down and fallen to the ground, it, you're back to the other scenario again. You know, with hot fire gases and combustible gases. Um, so yes, it works, but you're buying yourself very little time. What was uh, what was the explanation where, where before Christer and you started diving into why powder? Yeah, uh, it was how, how powder actually extinguish. Yeah, and Hallens also. It was also the um, uh, you know a phenomenon, and, and we don't like phenomenon. So what what's the problem? Well, it shows that any cold object that can be introduced into a flame, it could be an inert gas like carbon dioxide, or it could be powder uh, in solid form, but yet very, very fine uh, distributed uh, with very, very fine corns that um, cools the flame cools the little area around the little grain of, of powder and they are so close so those cool areas overlaps, uh, the flame goes out huh, immediately. And <coughs> powder was uh, uh, given an, an explanation that it extinguishes by inhibition. It did something to the flame, chemical or whatever, but uh, we are very convinced that this is only a physical thing. You introduce something cold into the flame and re you'd reduce the flame temperature to less than the outer ignition temperature and then the flame goes out. And what you introduce could be powder, water drops, whatever. And we um, had a very, very long discussions with between uh, us and the chemics, uh, chemical uh, doctors in the school, in the fire academy. And they were eagerly uh, promoting powder as having an inhibition effect on flames. But then we charged a uh, fire extinguisher with cement and achieved the same results as powder extinguishers. And there is no inhibition effect in cement, according to the chemists. So um, we believe it's uh, barely a physical thing. You put in something cold in the flame, you cool it a little bit to under the outer ignition temperature and the flame goes out immediately. And uh, you could uh, introduce anything that doesn't contribute to the combustion process. So you cannot uh, introduce propane gas, cold propane gas or something because it will contribute, but you can introduce powder, you can uh, nitrogen, CO2. Uh, you could uh, introduce propane if it's over carbureted. 
uh, yes, but now I'm talking about an open, <laughs> open flame. Um, well, Kirchner wanted to do it, but he, cement, never, he was never allowed sand, to do it. Sand, yeah. whatever, yeah. it will still cool the flame. We talked about gas cooling you know, uh, as the method. What is penciling and what is painting? Say again, please. What is penciling and what is painting? Was that terms introduced no. later than yours? I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> painting, painting and penciling was, you know, they, they started explaining, you know, you're painting the ceiling when you're, mm. you know, you knock down the flames, you, you cool the gases, mm. you need to wet the surfaces, then you're painting. Sounds like layman's method. No, it's, it's actually after you, you just super small amounts of water just to cool the surfaces when you... Uh -huh. Okay. You achieved gas suppression. Okay. Oh. Uh, I say, I think you told me. Not familiar. That. No. Right. Uh, uh, duh, 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 duh. The door procedure, was that something you kind of worked on? Or was that added later? When you, know, the, 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 when you first arrive at a house fire, you, in, you to evaluate the situation mm. inside, you paint, you, you know, you get some water and all check, check for if it's hot in there. Was that something you implemented or was that developed later? No, nope. implemented uh, right away. Uh, it's in the concept of use, uh, using short bursts uh, of water because give it a short burst, see what happens. Then you advance, give it a short burst, see what happens. Then you advance, on and so on. So, um, um, it was introduced right away with uh, smoke gas cooling, yes. Well, the, the, what do you look for when you do the, those short purses, you know, kind of like, you call it a temperature check, or do you, what do you call it, what are you looking at for? Checking fire behavior, yeah. smoke gas behavior. Uh, if I have any success or uh, if there is no uh, if there is no difference after a short burst of water you're probably in the wrong place you're not where the smoke is hot you're not where the, where the uh, surfaces are, are hot uh, advance go on it's not dangerous continue, find victims, find the initial fire, go on. Until when you come close to the fire or where the smoke is hot, you can see the neutral layer raise. Okay, here I have some hot fire gases and they are responding to my uh, little initial attack here. Or you may have the neutral layer going down but you can also feel that there is more humidity in the smoke. Okay, I have a hot surface here, so I have done layman's method by mistake. Uh, so these short bursts are uh, check, and of course you start as soon as you can. As soon as you are introduced into the confined space where you have the fire, check off the smoke gases. What was the, what was in, in your way, what was the biggest the biggest ideas that you uh, that Christer had from the beginning that you and him worked on later, you know, what was the biggest ideas that you had that was different from from before? Uh, <clears throat> In my own opinion, definitely that smoke diving is a dangerous job. You're actually going way inside buildings into combustible gases without offensive, uh, this tool that you can do offensive firefighting, you really have no defense if uh, you have a flashover. Uh, but now with this uh, fog fighter and on, uh, this offensive firefighting uh, and the knowledge to predict that it's soon coming, then you're safe all the time uh, and it's really not a problem. That's a very big relief for every smoke diver. Instead of trusting that maybe there is a phenomenon hit in my head, I know what's going on and I can see it before it happens. So 
and I can also handle it before it happens. Smoke guns, cooling. That's a big difference. What what happened to you uh, after you and uh, you and Christer worked on theories? Uh, what happened to to Christer? Um, Christo uh, still worked in the National Swedish uh, Rescue Agency and um, uh, he got more and more unpopular with the management because Christo is the type that questions things even if they have been through, uh, through for a thousand years he can still question them you know and turn them upside down and twist them around and see if there is anything uh, wrong or untrustworthy with them. And uh, he also did that to uh, uh, people and <laughs> the management. So he became more and more unpopular and um, uh, after some years uh, uh, he was um, uh, he was actually sacked. They uh, paid him a couple of um, a years' salary and said thank you and goodbye. And then he started uh, with his second biggest hobby, which was dogs and dogs breeding. And um, he had. Um, very, very fine dogs, uh, Nordic champions uh, in, in that race. And he started to import uh, 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 high-grade dog food from Germany and sell and distribute that in, in the country. Uh, he died having a heart attack when we has when he was unloading his truck from having been in Germany to buy a truck full of dog food. Is it the is it the the destiny of one who challenges the system and 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 you know the the current beliefs that any is it is it are they doomed to be to be heroes in their, you know, long after they did it. Because I, I mean, mm. I know you and Christa had a very hard time changing things in mm. Sweden. There was, of course, a lot of people really rooting for you and, and hoping to change, but overall it's a very mm. hard process. Do you think that that's, you know, is it is it, are, are, are change agents doomed mm. to always work in, in headwind? Uh, yes, it is, because uh, fire department organizations are very much depending on that you learn the trade from mouth to mouth from older colleagues. And uh, this makes it, um, what I call it, a more of the same organization. And uh, uh, more of the same organization is significant because uh, uh, you improve what you're doing, you know. You can improve, uh, for instance, the BA sets. If you can make them three ounces lighter, it's a God's given thing, you know, and everybody supports that, you know. But... Um, uh, changing things to we're going to change to another brand of BA sets or something that is so big that everybody will reject it because it's not through the ranks and uh, so I think all kinds of uh, changes in in uh, more of the same organizations are uh, in headwind uh, and then you have to do this a little bit respectfully to succeed. And I think Christer, he was so hot spurred that he was not respectful enough. And that's what created enemies for him. 
and that's what also made his decline and fall in that organization. But I'm still surprised that a big organization like that didn't keep this uh, free-thinking, innovative man uh, in his organization and found some kind of slot for him where he could do experiments and uh, do crazy developments or whatever. Mm. But perhaps that says more about the organization than about him. Do you have any, do you have any tips for people working in what they feel is a, a very challenging situation but, but bringing change to to these more of the same organizations, what kind of tips and, and tricks do you have? Uh, even, even how frustrated you are, you still uh, have to respect the organization you are trying to change. If you don't do that, you will definitely not succeed. You do have to respect it. You have to have patience. Maybe things are not going as fast as you were hoping for. Uh, but still you have to respect it and accept that it takes time. But then again, don't give up and don't make them change your aims. You got to have your straight line because you have, if you haven't, the organization will not know where you're going. Is it is it is there a you know like a secret formula to how you present things for an organization or a group of people that makes them more likely to accept these? Respectfully. Respectfully. Yes. You cannot tell people you dumbasses you haven't understood this, and uh, even though it's obvious for everybody, of course we should do like this and this and this. So. How many friends do you get from a presentation like that? Uh, Krista had a problem understanding that. He was not social in that way. And he was impatient. And that cost him his problems. But if you're respectful, but you don't fall down, you keep your straight line, it will give result in some time. And even if you don't like the time perspective, it's the only way to do it. <laughs>